Hi and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Simon and today I'm here to have a chat with you about DNFing books, why I want to DNF more books in 2024 and have a chat with you about some of the books, well no, all of the books that I DNF'd in 2023. And this is a nice, I think, segue video between my intentions for 2024, which was my last video where I was talking about how I wanted to DNF a bit more and also my next video which is going to be my top reads of 2023 and then we are done with 2023 we're properly in full throttle for 2024 which is very exciting. Why do I want to DNF more books? It's because I want to get through more books that I have on my shelves. I'm aware I've accumulated quite a lot of books. I talked about why that is and how I don't feel any guilt about it or pressure in a different video, which I will link down below. In essence, these are all the adventures that I'm yet to have, but I know I won't love every single one. However, there is part of me that even though I often talk about how my granddad, before he died, said his only regret was finishing books he didn't enjoy and used to have a rule of DNFing a book by page 60 if he wasn't enjoying it. I don't always practice what I preach and I would like to more. And I know some people have sort of questioned that 60 page figure because they were saying, well, if you've read a book that's only going to be 120 pages long and you DNF at page 60, that's halfway through. Well, one, there's nothing wrong with DNFing a book halfway through. Two, sometimes you might DNF a book 100 pages in, 300 pages in, whatever, as I will discuss shortly. But also, it's a by page 60. It doesn't have to be bang on page 60. But it's something that I would like to, like I say, practice as much as I often preach it. Because I do think, looking back at my books that I read in 2023 shelves, in order to make my top books of 2023, like I said, next video, I keep uh, promoting that, don't I? I realised that there would probably be, maybe not quite a quarter, but not far off of the books on there that I probably could have DNF'd. Well, the world wouldn't have ended, frankly. It possibly meant I'd moved on to more stuff and read even more books that I loved, apart from the ones that I'll talk about in the next video. Can't stop it, won't stop it, refuse. Teasing. I just feel like it will help me sort of keep a pace with my books. And actually, if there are any books that I find where I'm reading them, but then rewarding myself, rewarding myself, with picking up my phone to have a bit of a scroll after a chapter, they are either DNF for now or DNF forever. That is something that I want to address a bit because I don't feel like if you DNF a book, it has to be forever. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes you know that these are not going to be books for you. And again, we can talk about some of those when we go back through the books that I DNF'd in 2023, because some of them have gone back on my shelves for a date in the future. But I don't think it has to be cut and dry. I think it's just about, you know, sometimes it's the case of right book, wrong mood. I'm going to start off first with two books that I read all of, but kind of show, I think, the spectrum of reading and where there is a bit of a grey area. I actually said that I DNF'd this book in the video, the epic over an hour long video that Mum and I did on her channel about the prompts we read. It's because I got myself in a muddle. I did finish The Franchise Affair by Josephine Tay, but I wish I hadn't finished it because it was a book that the premise sounded incredible about this young woman who's gone missing. She suddenly appears and she says that she was kidnapped by these two women who are living in a big mansion house and they know nothing of it. That sounded so good. And then I started reading it and Josephine Tay was being so misogynistic towards the young girl and these two spinsters living together that I just was like, oh, why am I still carrying on? And it's because with it being a crime novel slash thriller, I wanted to get to the end. But in hindsight, I can't really remember the ending. I just remember being really angry with the whole book and the cast of characters being so vile to women, even the women to the other women, and Josephine Tay by default, even through male misogynistic characters, was still being awful to women, that I just ended up leaving it feeling really cross and wishing I hadn't read it. So we have that one. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I guess, is the books that we almost DNF, but when we finish them, we're glad of it. And then I'll head on to all the ones that I DNF'd some for now, some for forever. But the book that really sort of sums that up to me is Lauren Groff's The Vaster Wild, which is a book that I would pick up, quite enjoy, slash really enjoy at different parts, depending on what was going on, but put down and not think about, or finish a chapter and head to my phone and end up doom scrolling for like 10, 15 minutes or going off and just doing something else. And then I think, oh, I was reading that book and oh, I was quite enjoying it and picking it up again and going, oh yeah, I really, really kind of like it. 
and by the time I'd finished it, I was glad I'd read it. It wasn't one of my favourite books of the year, but also I'm like, would it have mattered if I hadn't finished it? And I'm not quite sure. It was one of those books that was just in that sort of grey area. And so basically what I'm saying is every book is completely different and sometimes it's worth completing a book and sometimes it's really not. So yeah, but that's a slight aside. I'm sure there are books where you felt like that and I do, that's where I guess it is a conundrum because then I think that's what stops me from being a bit more ruthless and stops me from practicing what I preach because I think, oh, it could be another Vaster Wilds or there is one book I can think of, I can't remember the name of it, it's something like On the Beach or something by Veronique Olmi. I'll try to remember to put the title down here somewhere. The final sort of three or four pages of that book are so incredible that it made it worth the real slow burn that that book was. But again, if I hadn't finished it and didn't know what the ending was, would that have, I don't know, would have that been awful? I prob Probably not. It's a dichotomy is what it is, I think. Going on to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight books that I DNF'd last year and starting off with that author that everybody loves you really want to love, you have read one, maybe two of their books and really, really enjoyed them, but still just don't quite get them and still keep struggling on, that's Eleanor Ferrento for me. <laughs> this is Troubling Love. And I did not understand what the funk was going on. I got so confused with this book about, and the premise again was one that I was really intrigued by. It was about a woman whose mother, her mother's supposedly dead. I mean, I don't know if she ended up actually being dead or being alive because I didn't finish the book but there was this thing within it that sounded so intriguing to me and kind of how she reacts to this and then how she goes and tries to find out more about her mother that she didn't know but I just got so confused by all the different characters and what everyone was up to and all of their different motives I was like nah this isn't for me. For me the only one of hers that I've really um, loved is the one. Why have all the names of books gone out of my head? The Lost Daughter. There we go. I do have a couple more of Eleanor Parente's books on my shelves. I just seem to not quite be able to give up the ghost with her and move on but maybe it's time. What do you think if I've only liked one out of say four, five? Is that, is that time to say fairly well? On two, and actually this is something that I did want to talk about and haven't, is blurbs. And why I think blurbs are responsible for a lot of naughtiness and why blurbs can lead you up the bookish garden path, heading to in the library or purchasing books in bookshops that actually aren't ready for you, but they've been marketed to make you think you want to read them. Or sometimes, and this is my least favourite of all, it gives you this plot point that actually is the end of the book and really should be the start of the book. And you think, why did the author spend 300 pages getting to this when they could have just started like 50 pages before the end and then carried on and it would have been an absolute corker. Anyway, I've gone on for an absolute tangent, which is my want. The book that sounded so good and I was so keen for because it was described as misery meets the vegetarian was the Whole by Hai Young Pyun, translated by Sora Kim Russell. And this is about a man who's in an accident and he, um, his wife dies in the accident and he wakes up at the hospital and he keeps seeing these really odd things. And I was like, oh my God, this is gonna get really, really dark and creepy. And then his mother-in-law turns up and it is a little bit sinister, but suddenly becomes really boring. And it went from intriguing to absolutely boring in a very short space of time. And so I was like, life's too short, I can't be dealing with it. But I really wanted to love this. And I think maybe that's why my frustration can come and why I push on. Because I'm like, come on, you said you were going to enjoy this. In your head, you thought it was going to be brilliant. And now you're saying, oh, it's not. And you're just giving it up. What a failure of a reader you are. And it's that naughty, naughty voice inside your own head that tells you off sometimes that I'm trying to also intentionally avoid slash silence in 2024. And so actually to pick up books and if they're not working for you or they're not what you thought they were gonna to be, to just be like, okay, that's cool. Let's all move on, not beat yourself up about it for several hours. So we have the whole. Then, and this is gonna sound really mean and I feel bad saying it, but there are the books that you start and then you sort of forget about and forget you're actually reading. <laughs> to be fair to this book, it was because it was described as a short story collection. So I thought, oh, well, what I'll do is, oh, sorry, interlinking short stories. I'll read this while I'm reading other books. 
and just read the other books. The book is Stories from the Tenants Downstairs by Sadiq Fafana. Now, I haven't decided if this is a DNF forever or for now. Actually, I should have said that with these. They're both DNFs forever. I can't see myself heading back to those two. This one, I am more inclined to because one, it's a book set in an apartment, well, a tenant, tenement block. And I really, really love books about a group of characters living in the same building. I mean, street will also do, but building is probably my favourite. There is something about all these different people having different lives and being so close to each other and sort of seeing glimmers of other people's life in the building and how they all interlink that I really, really like. And so I am umming and ahhing because there's a few of those sort of books that I've got fairly recently and I'm thinking, oh, that would make a nice themed reading vlog if the urge to do a themed reading vlog takes me at any point. I think it might have been right book, wrong time. And so this is a DNF, I think, for now, not forever. Like, I wasn't not enjoying this. I wasn't loving it, but I certainly wasn't hating it. I was thinking it was okay. Other things took precedent and took my attention. Now we have a book that everyone loves and you can kind of see why, but you're gonna wait for the movie if there is one instead, which sounds really odd. But that happened to me with Chain Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Aji Brenya. And I think this is probably a DNF forever because even though I was loving how action packed it was and it was really, really driving me through, I mean, I got not a massive amount of the way, oh, dog eared, absolute disgrace. So I was loving how the plot was really pacey and I was really getting into it, but I didn't really get to know the characters as well as I would have liked. And I was, to be fair, 78 pages in and feeling like they were more there for the plot. Well, a lot of characters get killed off very quickly and in quite a lot of detail. So there was that, which I don't mind. I'm not squeamish about stuff like that. But I think the whole time I was thinking, oh, I really want to love this because the blurbs told me that it's a sapphic hunger games, but also about prisons and how prisoners are treated in the American prison system, particularly prisoners of colour. It's also very much about reality TV and fame, and I find all of that very interesting. But I just kept thinking, it's reading a bit like a film, and I think I'd rather see the film of it than read the book, which reminds me of The Martian, a book that I wish I had DNF'd and just watched the movie instead. I still haven't watched the movie, but I thought that book was awful. I didn't think this was awful. I just didn't think this book was for me. And actually, I shouldn't have been surprised because I did read Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya's short story collection, Friday Black, and I enjoyed 60% of it, but didn't really, really love it. And mum really, really loved that. So that's why she's gonna get the uh, finished copy of this and um, I will recycle this proof. So there we have that one. Then you have the book that everybody seems to love and technically you should love it, but you just don't. And you've tried, <laughs> this is like, <laughs> additional thing because actually I could just finish there but in the case of this book I have tried three times to enjoy this book and it just hasn't happened for me but that said I've still put it as a DNF for now not forever that partly might be because I have a signed copy but also because I don't know I feel like I ended up with a bit of a bee in my bonnet about it and therefore couldn't move past that and I need to possibly read it somewhere very remote where I can't get my hands on any other book any other book and I will really really love it it is In Memoriam by Alice Wynne. Now, I have had some quite snarky comments about my not enjoying this book. And also, I think some people have taken some of the things I've said about this book in a negative way. So one thing that I kept saying about this book, which is initially set in a all boys school, two of the boys in the school have got feelings for each other, but they never communicate them. And then one goes out to the front and the other one follows. And... What I felt like when I started reading this book was it felt like every single character was gay. Now, I am a gay man myself. I am part of that community. I'm not trying to say there should not be books that are brimming with gay characters. I love Heartstopper. That said, I found the series Sex Education in the final series was going along that is everybody gay thing. And then there is the wonderful scene in in and out where you have that scene where it's like, is everybody gay? And that's how I was kind of feeling with this book and it was sort of taking away from it but also I found that the, there were so many characters at the start I couldn't work out which of the boys was which and sometimes I was actually getting them 
confused for another boy at the school who one of them would be having a dalliance with and then they were suddenly out the front with these characters and I was like oh hang on a minute I've got completely lost and then there would be lists of people who were injured or who died and I wasn't caring and I wanted to care and I also wanted to care about this relationship but I don't feel like I knew these two men well boys going into manhood particularly well so yeah that was my issue with this and I feel sad about it genuinely quite sad about it I can see through like some um what's it glass not clear you know when it's all like I'm sat on my own in a room and I can see in another room through some of that glass that I can't think of the word for and I can see all the sort of outlines and shapes of people having this brilliant party and they're all having these great conversations and a really good time talking about this but I'm just not in there and it's a really weird feeling I've not had that with a book I think maybe that feeling then isolated me from the book even more and that's not the book's fault so yeah there we go there's that one then you have the book that everyone was loving and practically wet themselves over and you were until you got about 200 maybe more pages into it and suddenly were like this has gone too far and you had another 300 pages to go and you were reading it with a lovely fellow uh, bookish buddy Ewan I'm sorry we never finished this one oh, actually I realized I've missed one book that I DNF'd which was another buddy read and that was If an Egyptian Cannot Speak English which I read with Nathan but that was just a case of right book completely wrong time because I was enjoying it but I knew I'd get more out of it when I had some more headspace with it. Anyway going back to the buddy read with Ewan and what book it was that everyone was getting very excited about and I really 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 loved until I really 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 didn't and shows that I do sometimes DNF books way past page 60 it's Brett Easton Ellis's The Shards and this on so many levels was working for me. Brett Easton Ellis is reflecting on his time as a student when he was, had started writing and stuff and he was starting to experiment with his sexuality and working out who he was. Be there was a um, serial killer in the area and it's how they all became embroiled and you are questioning who the serial killer is within the group and also you're questioning the reliability of Brett as a narrator and I love a book with an unreliable narrator and I really like the meta-ness of Brett Easton Ellis writing about a character called Brett Easton Ellis who was writing the books that Brett Easton Ellis has yet some of it was fictional well a lot of it was fictional um, but also clearly some of it was autobiographical I loved all of that but then there was one scene involving a dead body where I just thought I know you've been trying to gross me out quite a lot along the way and you are pushing and pushing and pushing me but you've just pushed me too far and I've gone over the cliff and I can't go back. I have seen people raving about this and I can see what they mean but for me that scene was so questionable and so bleh, and not even just like uncomfortable and also I couldn't even see the reason for it. I think that's what annoyed me. It felt voyeuristic to a really uncomfortable level. I should have possibly just got over it and moved on and sort of found out how it went but I just couldn't by that point and also I did feel this needed a bit of an edit. It was a big chunkster and needed possibly to be a little bit thin. It felt quite repetitive sometimes but I remember when myself and Ewan were reading this and I was thinking oh my god this is going to be a five star book then I was like oh no it's probably going to be a three then I was like oh no no it's going to be a five again oh no no and then it hit that point I was like nah this is just this is just not not for me and that's fine it's probably a DNF forever I think Um, I can't see myself heading to any more of Brett Easton Ellis's books and I have read American Psycho which actually I thought was really good in parts and five star in parts pushed me a little bit too far in the uncomfortable zone which is fine that can happen sometimes with the safety of fiction but then also had some really bloody boring bits about Genesis from what I remember I don't mean the bible I mean the band and last but not least are the books that frankly are just not very good books <laughs> they haven't been written particularly well and so it's time to say goodbye to them and I've got two that had sadly that um, effect on me the first of which was actually recommended to me in a bookshop Wave of Nostalgia in uh, Bronte country in the wonderful Howarth and it was a fabulous bookshop and they had some incredible books and this is one of the ones that I booked one of the ones that I booked, one of the ones that I bought because the bookseller was like, oh, this is sold really well. Everyone's raving about it. I thought it was brilliant. I thought this was so badly written. It was untrue. It's called Mad Woman, as you can see, by Louise Treger. And 
On the, well, the blurb again sounded incredible because it's saying in 1887, young Nellie Bly sets out for New York and a career in journalism, determined to make her way as a serious reporter. I don't usually read blurbs on my channel if you're new. If you're new, hi, by the way. And if you've been here a while, hi, obviously, and hello and lots of love. Anyway, moving on. She wants to be a serious reporter. Down to her last dime and desperate to prove her worth, she comes up with a dangerous plan to fake insanity and have herself committed to the asylum that looms on Blackwell's Island. There she will work undercover to document and expose the wretched conditions faced by the patients. This blurb is one of those ones that I mentioned about where I was about seven chapters in and was nowhere near that asylum and yet that was what had made me want to read the book in addition to then being hand sold it by the bookseller and yeah for me fibbing blurb not going to say lying because I don't want to be sued by any publishers but fibbing blurb and disappointing but also just dry it felt like the author was really showing you off their research rather than having done so much research they were so in the time that you were too because I don't like a historical fiction I don't know why I'm wanting to talk about knobs but I'm going to where like a character will obsess over a doorknob as they turn it in order to get somewhere because nobody thinks about their doorknobs that much do they or maybe I'm wrong but I don't feel like people have done or do it was that kind of book a bit of a detailed doorknob book there's a whole new genre. And then the other one was one of the books that I started at the end of the year and was really excited about because it was, I love books set on trains. I really, really love train journeys. I never read on a train like I intend to because I'm far too busy being nosy out the window, but I do lo love books set on trains. Anyway, this is the book that I started that was set on a train, Murder on the Christmas Express by Alexandra Benedict. And I picked this because I thought, oh, this will be a fun read over the festive season. I don't pick Christmassy books up that often. And so maybe the fact it was a Christmassy book could have been what stopped me, but it wasn't. Because actually I was very much in the mood. I was really excited about a murder mystery set on a train that's going from London to Scotland on the sleeper, which I've always, 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 always wanted to do and one day will. And and yeah, I, I just hated it. <laughs> so I think alarm bells rang for me a little bit when it started off with, oh, there are Kate Bush uh, song titles hidden within this book, sometimes really well, sometimes a bit blatantly. Look out for them. Oh, there's anagrams that you can find in this book. And I was like, mm, this is trying possibly a little bit too hard. But I went with it and I spotted a couple of the Kate Bush ones. However, I just didn't gel with the writing. The lead detective, oh well no, she was a retired detective who's trying to get home to see her daughter and her wife have their baby. That kept being pushed a lot, like the daughter's a lesbian, the daughter's a lesbian, but also the main uh, protagonist character, detective lady. I don't think I've ever read someone be described as bisexual so many times in such a short space of time. It just felt like it was trying really hard to show how with it it was. And I was like, you don't need to. You could have just mentioned that once, maybe twice, Max. We get it. It's fine. And also there were, I'm going to see if I can find the page because there was just so many analogies around snow. There's one point where, oh, here we are. She could hear the distress in Heather's voice as she talked with the midwife whose low reassuring tones flowed like the warm water that filled a birthing pool. Her daughter's about to have a baby, a little bit too on the nose, as was the constant referring everything to something snowy. And then one of my least favourites was also the lights of London look like fairy lights. Lights looking like lights. How strange. I really, really, really got miffed off with this book. I mean, I almost started to, you know, when sometimes you're really loving, kind of hating something, but I don't think that's a very healthy way to uh, read. So yeah, that's where we got to with that. So there we are. Those are the books that I DNF last year. Those were some of my thoughts on why I want to DNF more. I'd love to know your thoughts on DNFing. Let me know any books that you DNF last year. Were they ones that everyone else was loving? Were they ones that everyone was loathing and you just decided to give them up? I don't think I've done that actually. But also, what are your thoughts on DNFing, if I haven't said that already? And do you have any rules around it? Do you do it often? Do you barely do it at all? And obviously keep the conversation going with all those questions down in the comments down below. But also my Patreon, my Instagram and my wishes and all those things are linked down below if you'd like more stuff to go and head to. If not, totally fine. And I will see you to talk about my top books of 2023 very, very soon. Bye.